I'm, I'm hoping uh, people are seeing this first slide. Um, can you tell me if that is so? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Um, so uh, this land acknowledgement, I just would like to give you a minute to read it before we move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm Jane Hill. I'm the executive director of the Humboldt County Historical Society. And today I want to share with you uh, a, what we're calling a lecture, which is letters from the Yukon. Uh, these letters were written as far as we can figure out from 1893, between 1893 and 1919. And uh, many of the images you're going to see are from the Historical Society collections but they illustrate topics. They are not accurate representations of the things being described. There are famous historians who have shaped our view of the past and colored our path to the future. The experiences of ordinary people are not always captured, but fortunately, a cardboard box full of the experiences of one lifelong Humboldt County resident, Edith Stevens, was rescued from the side of the road in 1980 by Ben and Christine Hawkins and taken to the Clark Museum in Eureka. Thanks to the insistence of a dear friend who was then on the Clark's board of directors, I was persuaded to turn these letters, documents, and journals into a one-woman show titled Nothing Remarkable, which was a phrase commonly used to describe events that from today's perspective seem very remarkable. I performed the play at the Clark Museum in November 1984. Among the most interesting things in the box of papers were letters from Edith's brother, Johnny, who spent decades in the Yukon. He was charming and funny, which is clear from his letters, and she faithfully saved them. One letter was scrawled on a paper bag. Johnny said, in, 17, in 1873, I chose Chicago to be born in, and the people were so delighted, they decided to make the city famous. Present growth and prosperity are the result. Father came to Eureka in 1873, seven days from Seattle on the steamer Pelican. The old Pelican creaked and groaned with every roll of the ship. Father said he jumped off the pilot house to the deck and left his heel prints in the deck planks. A few years later, the Pelican was sold to the Mexican Navy. My father bought from Jack Armstrong on the south side of 13th Street between G and F. There was a large pond on 13th where the neighbor kids and me and my older brother Matthew rode in a boom my father built. He worked for the city as first street superintendent. I started a school at 3rd and G on the site of the condemned city hall. Ida King was the teacher. Some of the pupils were Will Hancock, son of the pastor at Methodist Church at 3rd and H, also Russ Bullock, Dan Donahue, John and Walter Simpson, Eva Davis, Sophie Gilmore, and Amanda Watkins, colored. Overcrowding transferred several to the building at 5th and E, and part of the building was used as a spring mattress factory. The big redwood stump on E Street was part of the play area for boys. Father moved to Bayside in 1893, and my younger sister and I still live on the home place. When the Vance Mill burned, one of the employees, Bart Tanny, said he lost his coat and a package of Duke's Cameo cigarettes that were not opened. Mr. Vance gave him a dollar and said a package of smokes was too much to lose. Unless memory plays tricks, the old steamer Humboldt was built at the foot of E Street. For years, that steamer sailed the route Eureka to San Francisco in all kinds of weather without a serious mishap. Then on a calm night, she tried to climb ashore on a beautiful sandy beach. I was thrilled in February 1899 on the way up the Lynn Canal on the Alaska coast to hear the whistle of that old wrecked steamer as that was the only thing saved as usable. Chris Bone was her pilot for years. He was our neighbor on Summer Street, 
said he missed the good old, good old boat. Yes, I spent 26 years in the Canadian Klondike and had some amusing and some hard experiences. People say there are more liars to the square foot in Alaska than you and Yukon than anywhere else. I resent that. And now he sends a Christmas message to the dear ones at home. Since Christmas is drawing near again, I'm thinking of you more and more because I have my mind set on spending the holidays with you. And I know you are also thinking of me. I have been in Dawson for two weeks, whoops, because it was too cold, uh, 45 to 64 degrees below zero to work the horses. And here you see many dead horses at Chilcote Pass because of the terrible weather. My partner, Charles Hill, left Sunday for 46 Bonanza with the horse in a load and had a terrible time, froze his nose and face generally. We have our cabin fixed up in feminine style with laces and tapestry and beautiful calendars. One room, nine by 13, is kitchen and dining room. The other, 12 by 13, contains three beds and each has his own decorations. Mine is pale green background with two shelves finished with pink shelf paper and pink silk, which Charles stole, and some of the calendars. That is the pink room. Dwell on the name. Charles Hill has a dark checkered cloth, two shelves, and photos. His is the Indian room. He says, use capitals. Jack Philbrook's is white background with calendars and photos and a row of his working and wearing apparel. The other wall I'm proud of, the anarchist artist arsenal, three rifles, three shotguns, six daggers and sheath knives, four revolvers, cartridge belts, and a pair of beaded Indian moccasins, two tables, and a stove complete the picture. Tomorrow, whoops, sorry, I missed, missed the stove. Damn it, there's the kind of stove they would have had. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to wash and make a rack over the stove on which we can dry our socks and mitts and help fix a sled to haul ice on. The ice in the creek is thin and the snow is not six inches deep, and we intend to haul ice from the river. I have some clippings which I will send. Somewhere, we helped change the mining laws of the Yukon and editorial comment on the same. Please save the clippings. When I began writing, I thought I could fill half a dozen such sheets but now I'm short of fuel. Nothing much remarkable to tell. Enclosed, you will find some violet seed that Charles Hill got from his mother in London, England. He claims they're very fragrant. Please send me some pressed yellow violets and seeds also, if you can get them, and you can save me from being called a liar. We'll close with best wishes for Merry Christmas and a very happy and prosperous new year. Write soon and often to John G.F. Stevens, Eureka Creek, Yukon Territory. P.S. Remember me to all my friends and tell them someday I'll wander back again. Little sister at home, dear one, if you knew how many times I want to write you letters, you'd feel glad. I often think tonight I'll write a few letters home, but I generally begin to read after supper and sometimes doze off while reading. And then about 9.30 or 10, undress and go to bed. After working all day and cooking for three, I don't do all I should at answering my letters. My partners, Charlie and Jack, are already sawing the air, but I will finish this letter before I turn in. You said you hoped I'd be back with you long before this, but I seem satisfied here. Well, I certainly would like to make a trip home and see you all and have a good talk and still hope for that blessing. I am surely well satisfied with this country. More so, I may even say that I probably would be in the States. There are many things here that could be improved upon, but taken all in all, this is, I think, the finest country in North America. When we read and compare the press reports between conditions, law, and order, and everything in general, no judge would give Canada a second place. I got your two papers and the wavy redwood last mail. I saw where Mrs. Joe Barkley, who used to live at Bayside, had passed on. The Arcadia Union gives more news than the Eureka papers. That Indian had his nerve to rob the Fortuna Bank to pay a feud debt. I think the feud part is a myth. And he continues. 
Last Saturday, I left here, or rather started to leave here at 10 a.m. for town. I was going to haul a borrowed wagon back to Quartz Creek by putting runners under the wheels, but it was too heavy to drag that way. So we took the wheels off and let the body down on a sled, which he pulled under the wagon and put the wheels on top of the load. First pull, I went 20 feet, then I lost the sled. Having fixed that, I pulled the next 50 feet and broke a tug. Finally, lit out and got about a thousand feet so badly drifted for a half mile that I had to break the crust in front of the horse when I upset and went back to camp to get Charlie to help to reload and make another bold dash. This time, going over a mile when the wagon and load slid ahead. After an hour or so, I got it back in place and fastened and was soon off the rough ground onto the flat where it was so badly drifted for a half mile that I had to break the crust in front of the horse and the balance of the 17 miles to Montana Creek was through about 10 inches of loose snow. When it got dark, I was about four miles from the hay ranch and 200 yards from the regular stage road when an eyelet in the harness broke. And I used a breaching strap and rope and was soon on the move again. Arrived at the hay ranch to find no one home. The cabin was locked, but the stable was open and warm. I fed the horse and decided to rest on for two or three, three or five hours and proceed to Quartz Creek. I had a good warm fur coat and laid down in the manger against a bale of hay and slept as cozy as a cat. Leaving a candle burning on the heater in a lantern grove, I lay, used it as a timepiece. And when it burned down about four inches, I hitched up again and headed for Macmillan's Roadhouse eight miles away and where I arrived at 1.15 a.m. After tending the horse, I routed Mac out and hustled a lunch for myself. It was a hard trip for the horse, but I enjoyed it myself as the weather was mild and a full moon was shining. If you hate to write, then don't write. But I write in love and would like to write more often, but there is so little to write about that it's sometimes hard to fill a letter with kindest love to all from John. Dear ones at home, see you're included. Nothing remarkable here. Monday, I went to town to Dawson and had quite a time with the sheriff who had been on a spree for a month and I could hardly get head or tail out of him. I wanted to settle up for the claim that I had sold to ourselves, the one that Peck sees for debt. I never saw a more nervous man in my life than that sheriff. I finally went to Peck's lawyer and we soon had things moving and made an appointment for the sheriff to be at his office at 4 p.m. and then had to talk like fathers to him before we finally got him to agree to the proposition. Finally got the papers recorded and had boundaries and three claims extended so that we got practically 400 feet more ground beside the claim we bought. We are now working that claim and the one we bought last year, which is wet or thawed ground where the pay runs all machinery and everything for $200. The story about Jack McCutcheon's trip up the coast from Seattle to Vancouver was true. To add insult to injury, Jack had a few bottles along on the boat and could not ask his chums in his cabin to drink as a priest was Jack's cabin mate. Just as he left it to meet his pals, a little girl went to Jack's door. His chums saw the incident, of, uh, so of course, they thought that accounted for Jack's not wanting company. The girl had made a mistake in the doors, and of course, no amount of explaining would clear Jack of not having a lady companion. The priest never left his bunk from start to finish of the voyage. Cross, crossing Queen Charlotte Sound, it was rough, and Jack had the upper bunk. During the night, the bunk broke, and Jack, bag and baggage, took the shortest route and landed plumb on top of the Holy Father. Jack said he taught the Father some language. He woke up half the passengers by swearing at the rotten old steamship and all connected with it. The Father said, quote, the bad weather and the bad bed make the bad language, unquote. Jack was still mad when he was telling me of it. I got six caribou, and some of them were quite dry eating. 
The biggest one, 200 pounds, is as dry as boiled liver. They travel hundreds of miles every fall and spring to a different localities. They sometimes go uh, in herds of tens of thousands. And last year, they passed Dawson, an estimate of 50,000 to 100,000 was placed on the numbers seen pass in one day. The trek lasted several days. Rabbits are here by the hundreds and the whole country is alive with them. Charlie's been feeling some better. He made breakfast this morning. He's one of twins, did I tell you? Born in London in 1866. At 18 years of age, he entered a stockbroker's office where he stayed three years until the firm failed. Then for two years, he followed bookmaking on the racetrack under the name of Charles Long, the Old Reliable. Then he set sail for Montreal. Soon the adventurous life of the cattle country lured him west. And for a year, he was a timekeeper for the millionaire contractor, Albert Martin of Kansas City. From there, he went to the Santa Fe Railroad then to raising sugar beets in New Mexico. He joined the Klondike Stampede in 1898 as a member of the R.C. Nesbitt Party on a sure thing rich strike on Beaver River. One year, he managed the store for E.D. McIntosh. As you can see, he's tried many things, and I count myself fortunate to have him for a partner. It's been almost 20 years now. Last Sunday, I had a dandy job sorting spuds. I had several sacks under my bed and saw sprouts growing through the sack. The sack was rotten because the spuds were frozen during the cold weather and about a quarter of each sack was a mush and smelled like rank fish. It was a pleasure to glom into it and pick the spuds out of it. The wet ones I put in cans to dry and have one can left out to use. We have no cellar for this cabin that is safe and have to keep our spuds in the cabin. I had four cases of cream under my bed too, and they seemed to be all right. Also two oil cans of eggs in water. Well, Charles is asleep for nearly an hour and I'm gonna get right busy myself. So sister dear, I will close. I always like to think I'll do better at writing, but there's usually nothing remarkable to tell. Where I may fail in writing, I will make up in love for all of you from your brother, John. Regarding our niece, there's no one that really enjoys having such an occurrence in the family. But since it's happened, I think your proper course, and I hope you have done so, is to treat her the same as before and not try to injure her feelings. It is regrettable that there is such a lot of laxity of virtue among the people of the present day. My wish for her and her hubby is that they live long and happily together. If he gets $50 per month, they ought to make both ends meet and be happy. I wish you could look out the window where I am writing and see the rabbits. They're running in every direction. The other night, I counted 17 in a space 10 by 10 feet. From our front door, a person can see rabbits at any time, day or night now. They are diseased, so will not be numerous in another year. I saw many dead ones along the road. Well, yes, I'd like to take a trip outside, sure enough, but no, no, don't know where that will be. If I leave here now, I'd be broke, and that would not be nice. You would not want me to come home broke, but such strange things happen sometimes. The boys are both in bed, and I think I will follow suit. Your affectionate brother, John. More later. Dearest friends, on Christmas Day, we had all the boys on the creek here and kept the ball rolling until 4.30 a.m. and wished for many returns of the feed and good cheer. While the feed was not dainty, it did justice in filling up and they did their best to clean the whole lot out. I gave them chicken soup, roast chicken and dressing, roast pork, baked salmon, roast caribou, pickled beets, mashed potatoes, mashed turnips, creamed carrots, cabbage, baked parsnips, pumpkin pie, spiced and plain cranberries, raspberries, blueberries, orange marmalade, rhubarb and various jellies, plain and layer cakes, wheat and rye bread, tea, cocoa, nuts, candy, plum pudding and sauce. And during the evening, wines and liquor. We got our shift, shift to bedrock and are now 
drifting, whoa, like me, and have varying pay. The bedrock is slabby and laying too flat to let the gold down in it, but the gravel is pretty fair. So far, it may average about two cents to the pan. There's an awful lot of boulders in the gravel, and Charlie tears large holes in the pure atmosphere when he talks to the rocks. Love to all, from John. I'll leave this sheet for a yuletide poem from a wanderer from near the pole, for to be again with the loved one's home is the inmost wishes of my soul. Though far away, I feel content. In dreamy pose, my thoughts take flight. Saint Nicholas has his blessing sent to all who seem apart tonight. I'm thinking how to finish this, but at it, better days I've seen. I'll send you each a hug and kiss and go and eat some pork and beans. If you can think of any more, please add it on behind. I need a feed, strength to restore, because I am the hungry kind. Dearest loves, I have not written to you for some time, nor heard from you for several weeks, but there are now two males in the office and hope for good news tomorrow when I will call for mine. The familiar company name of Hill and Stevens is no more, as I brought dear Charlie in Thursday, and he passed away at seven o'clock last evening after an illness of nearly two years, during which time he suffered much. He was helped in Christian science somewhat, but took treatment from a doctor and was too weak to sense to walk or help himself. And I fixed up a bed on the wagon and made him as comfortable as possible for the long trip of 50 miles, part of which was over very rough road. He had cancer of the stomach and was reduced to a mere shadow of himself. He will be buried Wednesday by the Yukon Order of Pioneers of which he is a member. The 22nd, we buried Charlie yesterday and the day was fine. I leave for the creek today to readjust things out there Hope all are well at home and will try to visit you this coming winter. I wanna get these letters in the next mail. I have been home now for some time and have piled up everything and made a list of the things for convenience of executor of Charlie's will. It's 6 a.m. Sunday morning and rabbits and camp robbers warbling and dozens of other birds flying around after flies. Was just up the road a mile to get the horse and will eat breakfast and saddle him and head for Montana Creek, where I will take a swim and probably fish for an hour. I've been looking over Charlie's things here at odd times, and he has a whole big war bag full of underwear, and much of it has never been worn. He surely believed in having plenty of everything. He also had enough seeds to plant an acre of garden. I hope you're well at home, and if I can make both ends meet, I will try to spend Christmas with you at home this year, which will mark my stay here just under the quarter century mark. I will now close with love to all from your loving con and brother, John. Charlie's death accomplished what no other hardship could. It brought him home again after 26 years. He spent the rest of his life in the family house until his death at the age of 92. I love his letters, which are a testimonial to the importance of one person's experiences in understanding a human condition in our shared history. I urge you to look through your own materials and consider donating them to the Humboldt County Historical Society so others can understand and share the events described. And if you're not a member of the Historical Society, please join and support our mission to further an understanding and appreciation of all people's places, events, and activities of Humboldt County and related areas by acquiring, preserving, interpreting, creating, and sharing historical information, and by educating and assisting others to do the same. And I will stop sharing this now if I can. Yes.
Um, and so if there are any questions that you have, let's see, Corinne, you'll be able to tell me what to do and how to do it, right? Yeah. So um, we don't have anything yet. So I'll just kind of wait a minute, see if anybody has any questions or comments. Okay. Um, if people do have things that they want to donate to the Historical Society, what's the best way to, for them to do that? The best thing to do is to call us or to email us and uh, let and talk to our, our uh, collections manager, Pamela Service, who, by the way, helped me find and, and track down a number of the slides for this presentation, as did our research assistant, Charlie Hilton. We've got a great staff here. And so uh, call if you think you have things that should belong in our collections and uh, Pam will help you evaluate whether we're the appropriate place for them to go. And is there anything, um, certain items that you prioritize like let, uh, letters, I assume, and photographs, are there other things like if people have videos or something like that? Yes, we can take videos, we can take films, we can take documents, we can take letters and uh, oral histories. Um, um, I would love to, uh, you know, I, it's because of my own personal bent. I really love the stories of ordinary people. But if you've had, uh, if you are part of a family that's had a business and you have their records, um, you know, we're very happy to look at them. We don't take everything because not everything, we're not the appropriate place for everything. For example, if you have architectural plans, I would say contact the Eureka Heritage Society. And if you have, um, uh, items for collection. We're not a museum, we're a research center. So uh, the Clark Museum may be a better place for you to donate those. But staff at any of these places are happy to talk to you about them and help you sort out what should happen next. Great. Um, so there is a question. Someone was wondering if you would know uh, the Christmas dinner where they had all the, the food and stuff. Where did they get all the different foods for that dinner? And were they close to a town where they were living? Yes, they were close to Dawson. And of course, I mean, I, I think that uh, they probably stored up a lot of stuff, you know, you know, they didn't need a freezer, they had a freezer, they were living in a freezer. So, uh, so they could get a lot of things as they as they needed them and probably in preparation for the holidays, when they were planning to invite all of the other miners nearby to come to a, to a, a shindig, a holiday shindig. Uh, they could bake ahead and things would last, they could make bread ahead, you know, all you had to do is put it someplace outdoors safe from marauding animals and you had a you had a, a many acred freezer at your hand. Okay. Um, let's see another question. Do you have any idea of how well he did financially? I don't think he ever did very well financially. I think I think uh, the numerous number of claims in that area as you saw from the map uh, and the fact that uh, it was expensive to live there just you know, uh, upkeep on the horses and the wagons and the cabin and all of those things and making enough money to feed each other and then finding a way to get the claims registered and everything. Uh, you know, I think letter after letter, letter, he was apologizing for not coming home for the holidays because he was broke. So, um, and I don't know, you know, maybe I, I suspect that that was a common experience of many of those who were part of the Yukon Stampede. There was just too much competition. And uh, after a while, the larger businesses took over and the individual miner uh, didn't have any way to put aside the fortune that he was uh, foreseeing when he, when he took off and, and went to that place. I think his affection, the experiences that he had living there, his partnership with those other miners, his obvious appreciation of the area around him, the wildlife, the views, um, the things that he experienced there in nature, that was very important for him. And I think that that was part of what kept him there. He could have come home a lot earlier uh, and probably gone into business somewhere here in Humboldt County, but he stayed there for 26 years. And I think it was not because he hoped in the last couple of years he'd finally get rich. Um, that's, that's not what happened. And so he came home kind of broke, I think, and then eked out a living here for the rest of his days. Um, there was another question. Do you think they sent money back home? It sounds like maybe he didn't have much money to send. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Well, did he send money back home? Oh, back to his family? that is never mentioned, so I don't think so. And uh, among the things that, uh, that were in that box were Edith's journals where she tra kept track of uh, how many eggs she sold that week 
And I think, you know, they had a little, it was a little farm, but they grew some things and, uh, and they raised chickens and hens and, and eggs. And I think that uh, she never mentions in those journals, she mentions the letters from Johnny and she's very excited, especially when any come that are addressed directly to her, but she never mentions receiving any money from him. So I just kind of think he wasn't in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, it looks like that was the end of our question. So thank you, Jane, for your presentation. Oh, wait, um, there is one more question. Is there a script of your show? There is a script of my show. And I finally, uh, it was only written in paper. It's funny because Chris and Ben Hawkins, who found the letters and the, and the, and all of the uh, paperwork that she had saved, um, came to me a couple years ago and uh and said that their son would like to use the content of the show for um uh for his classroom he's a fourth grade teacher and uh could i lend it to them and i had only my original typewritten script so i said yeah i'll, I'll lend it to you and i lend it to them and i forgot about it and they forgot about it and then a couple years ago i contacted them and i said hey do you still have that script and they did and brought it back to me and so at that point I put it into my computer. So there's now a computerized version. And uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to email that to anybody who wants to read the original work of art. I think you you at the Historical Society. Uh, did what? If someone's interested in it, they can reach you at the Historical Society. Yes. Well, they can reach me at the Historical Society. Right. And uh if uh, and if they email here, I'll get that, I'll get the information. Uh, for the production, uh, Pete Palmquist, whom many of you may kn have known, who is a wonderful local photo historian, he did, uh, we performed it on a little stage at the Clark, and there was a screen set up behind me, and Pete provided historic photos for the many things that she talks about, not just the stuff in Johnny's letters, but the things that she talks about, like the first automobile coming to Humboldt County, and some of the uh, of the other things that she mentions in her journals and Pete, Pete provided those images but again I have no idea where any of that stuff is including the original box of letters I don't know if it's somewhere at the Clark or if it's disappeared long ago and maybe the only record of what was in that box is now my script all right well um Looks like we are done with the questions. So um, thank you for your presentation. That was great. Um, we also want to, again, thank our um, sponsors, Cutting Edge Hair Salon and Carl Johnson's. Um, they are helping us kind of navigate into the hybrid territory where we can do a live stream of future um, programs. So um, really want to thank them and thank all of you for joining us. So um, thanks again. And I hope everybody has a great week. Great. Thanks, thanks. everybody.